And just to recap, and a healthy portion of this conversation has been around where derivatives are, again, in, in digital asset markets today. So um, CFI exchanges, right, SEXs, which is, you know, a, looks like a normal traditional exchange. There's fiat on off ramps. It operates with people, all the normal things that you would expect. DeFi being basically an exchange on software. So not people, digital assets in, digital assets out. But what about traditional markets? We talked a little bit about IBIT, and I think <clears throat> with the idea that traditional markets coming in, you know, whether it's option markets on all the exchanges that people use for option markets, whether it's more futures products, more swaps products, right? The derivatives market's very, very, very big, right? There's a lot of pieces of that that we haven't discussed yet. I'd love to get this panel's perspective on how the advent of more, both more products and more liquidity on traditional venues for equitized, let's just say equitized digital asset markets like iBid, for example, Bitcoin, is going to help. Um, I'd love to, to touch on that and then I'll have some follow-up questions, but maybe Andrew, I'll come back to you. I mean, one thing is it's not equitizing crypto, but the idea of, uh, I guess, converting the idea of perpetual futures into traditional exchanges is interesting. A lot of exchanges are trying to think about how they could do that. Very briefly, uh, uh, perpetual futures are very popular amongst uh, offshore crypto exchanges, widely used by retail, often more than 100 times levered. And the basic idea is rather than a futures contract having an expiration date, and until then you just exchange variation margin, in a perpetuals contract, every hour or every eight hours, you kind of true up your P&L, right? So you have an account which is going to fund your P&L fluctuations. But because of that, you're not funding anything and you don't need to have a forward. So the contract can go on as long as you hold it because you're just kind of truing up. The only kind of borrowing you're doing is for the next hour or the next eight hours. Um, the rates that can be implied from those futures prices are as much an expression of supply and demand as they are of funding, uh, which is fantastic information to have. But when you think about it, why should an equity index futures contract last, you know, four months, right? It's clunky. Uh, why not just change, exchange P&L every day and have the index futures contract go on forever? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one innovation that I think a lot of the kinks have been ironed out of uh, in, in crypto that a lot of exchanges might want to adopt for financial futures products. Um, to, the, to the question of equitizing, I have to go back to index products because the regulatory path of waiving in tokens one by one, which is how the SEC is approaching things here and how the SFC is approaching things in Hong Kong, um, is frustratingly slow and inagile, and I think there's a broad recognition of that. Um, index products which immediately grant investors diversification benefit, and also if one token goes bad in an index, it gets replaced, right? You don't lose everything and nobody has egg on their face too badly. So index products or broad market products that are both expressed in, let's say, ETF wrappers, but also in derivatives markets, are probably the ultimate tool to help the five percenters, uh, but also protect retail investors, and also allow the holdings of these long-term you know, crypto holdings to, to sort of refresh themselves into the latest winners. So we're hoping that there is a regulatory path to having methodology-driven index products be sort of a core crypto holding, perhaps outside of Bitcoin. What would an example of an index product be? Like if you, what would your wish list be? What would be number one? I mean, we, we launched Coindesk 20 about a year ago. It's traded close to $9 billion now in perpetual futures offshore. There are two funds launched. There's three structured products launched in Europe and in APAC. Uh, it has custodial support. It has already traded over the counter options with two dealers. The market's just begging for it, right? Uh, those investors who like to get exposure to risk assets via, let's say, principal protected notes rather than ETFs, this is perfect for them, right? An index product where they're not token picking. Everybody should own a little Bitcoin, but if you want Web3, you may not want a token pick. So after Bitcoin, what's next? And so, uh, that product's been super successful. The market's been ready for it. We have broader versions that are on deck to come out next. But liquidity and 
uh, standardization and broad adoption of one index so that everybody knows what the, how the options should be priced, how the forward should be priced. Um, fund managers know that market makers can trade it quickly, implementation will be cheap. That's the delivery that we want to make to the market to improve the investment environment for, for retail investors and for, and for high net worth family offices, all the way to institutions. Yeah, please, Chris, go ahead. You know, I have a huge wish list. There's going to be, to answer your question specifically, the options on IBIT, they'll bring new and more participants to the space, like, likely enhancing liquidity, but not without downside as well. Like, think about how they're going to settle in kind, right? So that, that makes that complexity push out a lot of participants. I think, and maybe not initially, and they'll learn the hard way, but um, I know what maybe Chris and I would like to see in addition to what Andy just described is some sector taxonomy and, and indices or baskets based on various sectors across uh, the digital asset space. We have to construct them internally with kind of a best efforts. Um, but like, for example, DPIN, which is decentralized physical infrastructure, there is roughly 200, 230 names that are, I wouldn't say investment grade, but reviewable that command your time to underwrite them and that's one of the newest spaces, right? And then it, meme coins could be their own sector basket. And I think from the initial sort of large cap baskets and indices, that would be great to see uh, next. I'll jump in. So I think to have true deep liquidity, you need institutions. And to have institutions, institutions are happy to take market risk. They don't want to take operational risk and they don't want to take regulatory risk. So let's look at operational risk. That leaves you with non-deliverable products. I think you can probably have a deliverable product if it's, if it's an, an equity or a bond or something. But for crypto, they don't want to deal with the hassle of custody and everything. So that leaves you with non-deliverable products. On the regulatory side, again, it's going to take some time to work this out. So if I'm thinking about the next version of products, which ones are, can satisfy both of those? I go back to rates. Why? Because rates are massive. They're commodities. Everyone knows they're commodities. It's a $500 trillion swaps market. Euro dollar futures was probably the largest, if one of the largest, if not the largest liquid futures market. Um, so to me, that's the next obvious instrument and asset class that's staring us in the face. There, there's also the tech derivatives too. Hash rate, block space. For sure. Yeah, because there's a huge arms race in digital assets that very few are paying attention to. And particularly as rates are coming down, I think there's this massive quest for yield, right? And so when you have yield-like products, like look at the ETH staking rate right now, it's two times that of 10-year treasuries from a real yield perspective when you account for inflation. So I think those yield hunters are about to pop up and say, where can I get this exposure? There's also restaking, and there's protocols now like Babylon where you can actually post Bitcoin and get staking yields in a portfolio of, of altcoins that you select. Same with Eigenlayer, which just came out. Um, so th there is the advancement. First off, the best talent on the planet is in digital assets, period. Bar none. Sorry, folks. Uh, it, it's not even funny, the technology and traditional finance com combination. It's just pushing the envelope pretty much faster than anybody could assume. But there, there's all the, the different rates and the different willingness to to pay, and some of that can be a rate on automated market making, where effectively in DeFi, you can just push to a bot and it'll, it'll swap back and forth. Uniswap, is a, they just went over two trillion in, in total liquidity in the last four years. It's an amazing accomplishment for a decentralized exchange. But to Chris's point, rates in an almost like an on-ramp and off-ramp are extraordinarily easy to construct and monetize right now. Yeah, and, and if I think about um, my conversations, particularly with banks at the moment, NDFs. Um, not somebody said that somebody said the B word. Yeah, right. uh, those are those are definitely um, high on the list for for banks. Again, for the same reason as Chris pointed out, they can't hold the underlying crypto. So a derivative product is is a much easier way for them to enter the space. And again, when you think about the the institutions that they're covering, that suits. That suits their risk as well. It's, it's off balance sheet. There's no underlying deliverables. They don't have to worry about custody. And then you can incorporate all these cold indices and all these, this other exposure into the, into the NDF. So it's a, it's, a, it's a quickly growing space. People really want to get into it. It's a it. super important point. And 
we're desperate for banks to enter. Banks can't hold crypto because of the BIS capital reserve rules, which make it punitively expensive. Um, and banks are broadly reticent to lend against, you know, to lend against uh, uh, businesses or, or assets specifically. So the synthetic ex expression of that risk, whether it's passed through into <laughs> products that they issue or just proprietary positions or, or kind of going back to back between hedge funds, um, is what they're limited to right now, and there's still a lot of activity, uh, mostly on the risk space or the option space. The rate space, as it begins to pick up, even before a real yield curve builds, um, is going to sort of, sort of eclipse a lot of a lot of the you know the small speculative stuff that we see going on. So that's I feel like right around the corner. Uh, it really requires senior leaders at 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 big banks to sort of to sort of warm up to this and sponsor those ideas because I think the reputational risk is is start to become the reputational risk is going to become why aren't you doing this not why are you doing this yeah and it's the US banks that are struggling the most for obvious reasons uh, the European banks are way out in front in terms of they're even looking at custody and uh, you know they're they're far advanced from the, the US counterparties